All right, hey there everyone. Welcome to my channel. Uh, I do educational videos on this channel on many different topics, but for the last several months we've been focused on learning about the reciprocal system of theory. And the reciprocal system of theory is a system of theory that was derived by Dewey B. Larson uh, back in the 20th century up until his death in 1990. Mr. Larson uh, wrote many books and um, is a hero of mine, um, not necessarily uh, because he didn't was perfect or something, he didn't make any mistakes, but because he stuck to his guns and he worked it out over the, uh, a long, long period of time and uh, presented his material conscientiously and, um, you know, Never got any credit for what he did. Uh, did it for the for the principle of it, for the love of it, for the truth of it. And um, you know, I'm trying to um, now that he's dead. I'm trying to. I mean, he's been dead for 32 years, but I'd never discovered the theory until well after he died. You know, I discovered it maybe in 2001, 2002, and. Um, read pretty much all his books and probably all his articles. And, um, you know, there have been uh, some other people that have written on his, um, on his theory as well. The basic idea behind the reciprocal system of theory is that we live in a universe of motion. The universe is not made out of matter. It's not made out of energy. It is made out of motion. Matter and energy are me merely two different kinds of motion. As, uh, as are many other different scientific phenomena, such as uh, pressure, acceleration, uh, magnetic flux, electric current, electric charge. Uh, these are all different forms of motion. Motion, he defined as the relationship between space and time. Uh, space and time are uh, thereby reciprocals of each other. Motion you could think of as a fraction with time or space as the numerator and space or time as the denominator. But it's a little more complicated than that because space and time have their coordinate aspects, meaning that they can come in one, two, three, or even more dimensions. Uh, so when you have your numerator and your denominator, you can have you know time to the third power or space to the third power or... You know, in the case of things like density, you have density is time to the third power over space to the uh, sixth power. Um, and, uh, you know, pressure is time, uh, time over space to the fourth power. Uh, but you also have uh, time and space having their uh, clock aspects, which is the scalar motion. A scalar motion is uh, really what Larson says that the mo uh, universe is made out of. Motion with a magnitude but no direction. You can envision a scalar motion as a um, uh, using a balloon and a magic marker. You put a bunch of dots on the balloon and if you blow up the balloon, all of the dots are moving away from each other. That is a scalar motion, a motion with a magnitude but no particular direction. You suck in the balloon and then all of the dots are moving toward each other but in no particular direction. That is an inward scalar motion. So the only direction that scalar motion has is in or out. And um, so time and space both have those uh, that clock aspect. It's flowing. It's always getting later and later in the case of time. And in the case of space, things are always getting farther and farther apart. Space and time also only come in discrete units, meaning that there is a minimum unit of time and a minimum unit of space. Inside of a one unit of space, you have only time. Inside of, and Larson calls that the time region. And inside of space, inside one unit of time, you have only space. Larson calls that the space region. Uh, if you have one unit of uh, space in one unit of time, you have the speed of light. 
The speed of light is basically the origin or the background of this universe. And there is an entire half of the universe that's moving faster than the speed of light. Uh, and an entire half of the universe moving slower than the speed of light. This is the only half that Einstein recognized when he said that the speed of light is the maximum speed of the universe. Uh, that was only referring to what Larson calls the material sector, the half that's moving faster than the, or slower than the speed of light. The half that's moving faster than the speed of light, Larson calls the cosmic sector. And in that sector, uh, that has more to do with things like life, phenomena and mental phenomena and um, but it also comes into play in many other uh, applications of his theory what I love about Larson's theory one uh, is it it gives you agency uh, you don't always have to rely on the um, pointy headed scientists with the white lab coats um, to tell you what you're supposed to think you can figure it out for yourself if you have the reciprocal system and a little bit of perseverance, you can figure some things out for yourself. Also, uh, I love how he is very consistent. Sometimes if you just read one or two of his books, you're like, where is he getting this from? He seems like he's just kind of coming up with this out of no place. But then if you read enough of his, his material, you see that he's applying things very, very consistently. And... Um, you know, things apply in one region, uh, one field, you know, in astronomy, and they also apply in the same way in atomic physics uh, and so on. Okay, now we are looking at his uh, 1979 book here that's called Nothing But Motion. Uh, primarily, it's on physics. Uh, here, we're about to start chapter nine, which is called rotational combinations. So when Larson has, mo when he says motion, he's really, he refers to really four different kinds of motion. First, you have a translational motion, and then you also have a vibrational motion. And then you have a rotational motion. And then you have a rotational vibration. Okay, so those are really the four different kinds of different motions. And here in chapter 9, he's going to be focused on the rotational combinations. Uh, these will ultimately be uh, your subatomic particles and your uh, atoms. Um, okay, we're going to start uh, with Mr. Larson's words right here. One of the principal difficulties that is encountered in explaining the reciprocal system of theory or portions portions thereof is a general tendency on the part of readers or listeners to assume that the author or speaker, whoever he may be, does not actually mean what he says. No previous major theory is purely theoretical. Everyone takes certain empirical information as a given element in the premises of the theory. The conventional theory of matter, for example, takes the existence of matter as a given. It then assumes that this matter is composed of elementary particles, which it attempts to identify with observed material particles. On the basis of this assumption, together with the empirical information introduced into the theory, it then attempts to explain the observed range of structural characteristics Inasmuch as all previous theories of major scope have been constructed on this pattern, there is a general impression that physical theories must be so constructed, and it is therefore assumed that when reference is made to the fact that the reciprocal system utilizes no empirical data of any kind, this statement must have some meaning other than its literal significance. The theoretical development in the preceding chapter should dispose of this misapprehension so far as the qualitative aspect of the universe is concerned. While the task is still only in the early stages, enough of the basic features of the physical universe, radiation, matter, gravitation, etc., have been derived by deduction from the postulates, 
without the aid of further assumptions or of empirical information to demonstrate that a purely theoretical qualitative development is in fact feasible. But a complete account of a theoretical universe must necessarily include the qualitative aspects of physical phenomena as well as the, I'm sorry, the quantitative aspects of physical phenomena as well as the qualitative aspects. Here is another place where the way in which the development of theory has taken place is mistakenly regarded as the way in which this development must take place. The theoretical products of the Newtonian era, so-called classical physics, were capable of being expressed in simple mathematical terms, but some deviations from the classical laws have been encountered in the far out regions that have been reached by observation and experiment in recent years. And the physicists have not been able to account for these deviations without employing extremely complex mathematical processes, together with conceptual artifices of a rather dubious character, such as Einstein's rubber yardstick or fudge factor. In the light of the points brought out in the preceding chapter, it is now evident that the difficulties are due to a misunderstanding of the basic nature of the far out phenomena. But since the modern theorists have not realized this, they have concluded that the true relationships of the universe are extremely complex and that they cannot be expressed by anything other than very complex mathematics. The general acceptance of this view of the situation has led to a large segment of the scientific community particularly the theoretical physicists, to the further conclusion that any treatment of the subject matter by means of simple mathematics is necessarily wrong and can safely be dismissed without examination. Indeed, many of these individuals go a step farther and characterize such a treatment as, quote, non-mathematical. This attitude is, of course, preposterous, and it cannot be defended, but it is nevertheless so widespread that it constitutes a serious obstacle in the way of a full appreciation of the merits of any simple mathematical treatment. In beginning the qualitative ask, in beginning the quantitative development of the reciprocal system of theory it is therefore necessary to emphasize that simplicity is a virtue, not a defect. It is so recognized in principle by scientists in general, including those who are now contending that the universe is fundamentally complex, or even as expressed by Bridgman, that it is, quote, uh, is not intrinsically reasonable or understandable. End quote. In its entirety, the universe is indeed complex, extremely so, but as the initial steps in the development of the reciprocal system in the preceding pages have already begun to demonstrate from a quali qualitative standpoint, it is actually a complex aggregate of interrelated simple elements. The principal advantage of mathematical treatment of physical subject matter is the precision with which knowledge of a mathematical character can be developed and expressed. This is offset to a considerable degree, however, by the fact that mathematical knowledge of physical phenomena is incomplete and from the physical standpoint ambiguous. No mathematical statement of a physical relation is complete in itself. As Bridgman frequently pointed out, it must be accompanied by a text that tells us what the mathematics mean and how they are to be applied. There is no definite and fixed relation between this text and the mathematics. That is, every mathematical statement of a physical relation is capable of different interpretation. The importance of this point in the present connection lies in the fact that the reciprocal system makes relatively few changes in the mathematical aspects of current physical theory. The changes that it calls for are primarily conceptual. 
They require different interpretations of the mathematics, changes in the text, as Bridgman would say. Such changes, modifications of our ideas as to what the mathematics mean, obviously cannot be represented by al alterations in the mathematical expressions. These expressions will have to stand as they are. Many readers of the first edition have asked that the new ideas be put in mathematical form. But what these individuals really mean is that they want the theory put into some different mathematical form. They are, in effect, demanding that we change the mathematics and leave the concepts alone. This we cannot do. The errors in current physical thought are primarily conceptual, not mathematical, and the corrections have to be made where the errors are, are not somewhere else. There is nothing extraordinary about the close relation between the mathematical aspects of the reciprocal system and those of current theory. The conventional mathematical relations were, for the most part, derived empirically, and any correct theory of a more general nature must necessarily arrive at these same mathematics. But there is no guarantee that the prevailing interpretation of these mathematical results is correct. On the contrary, as Jeans or Jeans pointed out in the statement previously quoted, the physical interpretations of correct mathematical formula have often been badly wrong. Correction of the errors that have been made in the interpretation of the mathematical expressions often has very significant consequences, not so much in the particular area to which such an expression is directly applicable, but in collateral areas. The interpretation is usually tailored to fit the immediate physical situation reasonably well, but if it is not correct, it becomes an impediment to progress in related areas. If it does not actually lead to erroneous conclusions, such as the limitation on speed that Einstein derived from a wrong interpretation of the mathematics of acceleration at high speeds, it at least misses all of the significant collateral implications of the true explanation. For example, the mathematical statement of the recession of the distant galaxies merely tells us that these galaxies are receding at speeds directly proportional to their distances. The currently popular interpretation of this mathematical relation assumes that the recession is an ordinary vectorial motion. The problem in accounting for it then becomes a matter of identifying or inventing a force of sufficient magnitude to produce the extremely high speeds of the most distant objects. The accepted hypothesis is that they were produced by a gigantic explosion of the entire contents of the universe at some unique stage of history. The reciprocal system is in agreement with the mathematical aspects of current theory. It arrives theoretically at the conclusion that the distant galaxies must recede at speeds proportional to their respective distances, the same conclusion that present-day astronomy derives empirically. But the new theoretical system says that this recession is not a vectorial motion imparted to the galaxies by some powerful force. It is a scalar outward motion that results from viewing the galaxies in the context of a stationary spatial frame of reference, rather than in the natural moving reference system of reference to which all physical objects actually conform. Now just recall that Larson, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, changes that Larson makes is that he makes his measurement from unit speed or from the speed of light, not from zero. So, you know, if you make a normal measurement that, um, you know, the bicycle is moving 20 miles an hour, uh, that's 20 miles an hour from zero. But Larson, when he uh, makes his measurements, he makes them from what he calls the uh, progression of the natural reference system. 
and this progression of the natural reference system is outward at the speed of light in all directions. So, um, you know, when you're measuring a motion, you're measuring from that reference point, not from a stationary reference point, but from a moving reference point that's moving outward in the speed of, at the speed of light in all directions. So far as the recession phenomena is concerned, it makes little difference, aside from the implications for cosmology, which interpretation of the mathematical relation between speed and distance is accepted. But on the basis of the currently popular hypothesis, this relation has no further significance, whereas on the basis of the explanation derived from the postulates of the reciprocal system, the same forces that apply to the distant galaxies are applicable to all atoms and aggregates of matter, producing effects which vary with the relative magnitudes of the different forces involved. On the basis of this new information, the mathematical relation which applies to the galaxy is the galaxies is one of far-reaching importance. Okay, I think I'm going to stop it there, um, and we will resume tomorrow from that point. Uh, but uh, just, you know, um, I, I just want to say in terms of, you know, the recession of the distant galaxies, that was observed by the Hubble telescope back in the 20s. That was even before NASA came around. Um, but, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that it was a true... Um, a true measurement or that they weren't uh, messing around with, uh, they didn't have computers back then, but they might have been messing around with something else. But I do believe that even in the reevaluation of, you know, the shape of the universe, the shape of the earth and so on, that the reciprocal system is going to survive. Um, Larson kind of accepted, uh, you know, these measurements and he fit his theory into that. Um, so you can change it around. Okay, well, have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.